but before I, I give Blade the, the microphone, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, I don't want to make this about me, but I'll make it about me for just five seconds out of the next hour. Um, so Blake is the first you know, LSD student uh, from the lab for structure and dynamics um, to leave and, and graduate with a graduate degree here at UVM. So, so today's a big deal for me, and I'm, it's not too surprising that he's the first graduate student to leave my lab in some ways. Um, he, I, I met him as an undergraduate here at UVM. He took my algorithms for complex networks course, and I was really impressed how much he followed his own curiosity and interest. So I was you know, teaching in complex networks, but he took the time off to like, go attend a conference on that topic a conference that like, I thought I was too busy to attend, but he made the time for it between senior coursework and Connors College thesis and all that. So I, I, he's always found a way to like, follow his interest in a constructive way and let his curiosity guide him. So I'm not too surprised that, that he managed to graduate on this accelerated master schedule. Um, in some ways, though, it is also surprising. The accelerated master is coursework heavy. He had you know, lots of running and training on the track team and, and now has completed his thesis and prepared this presentation while doing a, a full-time job at uh, Max Seibold's lab in Denver. Um, so, so, you know, it's a unique skill to be able to like juggle these different schedules and I wish he'd stay with the lab for the next three years, but I, I'm also incredibly proud that he'll be the first graduate to leave and represent us abroad. Um, so I'm very excited to have Blake present his research to you today. Um, the other people I want to acknowledge are, are Chase um, Cockrell, who, who's joining us as, as chair of the evaluation committee. Uh, we, we have Darianne who's going to be joining uh, anytime and, and Professor Dodds um, from the Department of Mathematics also on the committee. So I want to thank you all for, for being here. And, and with that said, I'll pass the mic to, to Blake. I'll just give like one little advice. The slides are optimized for Zoom. If you wanna try and see Blake, I think we can all like turn off our video. And if you 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 ask a Zoom to hide non-video participants, you should be able to put Blake in the top right of the, of the slides. Blake, the floor is yours. All right, thank you for the introduction, Laurence. Hello everybody from West Coast time and, or Mountain time rather, and welcome to my master's thesis defense. So my name is Blake Williams, and today I'm going to be sharing with you the work I've done over the past two years as a part of my master's in complex systems and data science under the guidance of Professor Laurent Grit Frain. Now this body of work is entitled On the Dynamics and Structure of Multiple Strain Epidemic Models and Genotype Networks, and it largely falls under two fields of study, um, infectious disease modeling and network science. So today we're going to be learning about their intersection, how network science contributes to epidemics, not just at the social, but also at the genetic level, and how infectious diseases can teach us some tools that may be applied a little bit more broadly in network science. Now, since many of you consider yourselves Vermonters, I think it would be a familiar metaphor to use hiking this morning to guide our way. So in this first chapter, I'm going to introduce to you a multi-strain epidemic model. We can think of this as trailblazing in the foothills, traveling along the familiar paths in the vast wilderness that is epidemic models, but making our own new path with a new model. The second chapter will present a novel genotype network data set for influenza. And this will show us how strains are related to one another genetically. And we can think of this as getting your hands dirty with the real data, uh, in order to get a top-down view of genotype network structure and enable us to use network analytics to study the evolution of influenza. A third chapter addresses the question that arises following the generation of the network in chapter two. How did it get to be that way? What processes led to the network having the structure that it does? So this seems on par with a conversation you might have with a through hiker, perhaps with a beer that rivals Professor Danforth on their journey on the long trail. So this person might know the ins and outs of the mountains, perhaps how they rose from the ground years ago. And what we wanna do is gain that same wisdom about these networks, try to know how they may have arisen just by knowing their present state. The fourth and final chapter is sort of a resolution to the work done in the previous chapters. So now that we know a thing or two about genotype networks, um, what are we gonna use this knowledge for? 
So I've always had a tradition of going to a diner after Day in the Mountains, which is a good time to talk about your next adventure. So this chapter uses what we've learned about genotype networks and provides that application or next adventure, um, which is a method that suggests strains to use influenza vaccines, um, which is a problem that's pretty difficult to answer in its own right. And this chapter um, provides a method to overcome some of the computational expense that's associated with selecting strains if you do it via simulation. So as there are four sections, there are four major outcomes to this work. The first is that epidemic dynamics are influenced by modeling um, multiple strains with a genotype network. Um, and that epidemics behave differently if you consider multiple strains and introduce interacting strain specific community. So instead of having one simple curve trying to flatten, you might have a roller coaster of infections to work with. Second is that genotype networks can be constructed for influenza viruses and offer us some insight on evolutionary dynamics. These networks have a characteristic structure and seem like they might be shaped by strain transcending immunity. Uh, in the third chapter, um, we see that age-weighted preferential attachment uh, seems to replicate the structure we see in the genotype network. Now this implies that how long a strain has been in existence for influences how likely it is for a new strain to be similar to it. And finally, we'll see that these genotype networks provide a method for, like, for selecting multiple strains for vaccination, which overcomes some of the computational expense associated with this task. So disease modeling and network science, the two topics of this presentation, why do they matter? So being able to model diseases allows us to understand how they work, both at a cellular and molecular level, all the way up to the population level. Now you could use this for forecasting as you've likely seen in the media and in your own lives regarding COVID. And this shows you that public policy influence is one of the more important end goals of infectious disease modeling but it can be pretty difficult to get this right. Um, the CDC gained some criticism in 2015 um, for some of the modeling they did regarding Ebola. And the problem they had here is that they used some inaccurate assumptions, um, which made it seem like there are gonna be more infections than was probably reasonable to assume. But when you get it right, you can learn more about a disease that you didn't know previously. So for instance, using network models, some researchers had found that sexual transmission was more influential in the spread of the disease than originally thought. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the R0 number. Well, there's also this thing called the K number or dispersion parameter that I think some of you might be familiar with as well, which is not the number of cases a person is expected to give to another person or in the population, but indicates how variable that number is. So this sort of number can kind of account for those super spreading events we've heard about with coronavirus. Um, and knowing about such a dynamic can be useful because um, although super spreading can make an, uh, an epidemic pretty um, unpredictable and hard to keep up with, it also provides us with an efficient way to control it if we're able to identify who those super spreaders are and implement interventions. Now, the second main field in this body of work is network science. So networks are a structure used to relate to things. Um, and here you see thing one and thing two as the things here. And we consider these things to be called nodes. Now, the second part of networks are edges, which connect nodes if there's the presence of some relationship between them. For instance, thing one and thing two appeared immediate together. So maybe we use that as our definition of an edge. Now, you can also have nodes in a network that aren't connected to other nodes. So correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Dodds, but I think Troy and Abed from Community never appeared in a show or a book with thing one and thing two. So in this network you, of these characters, you wouldn't connect them with edges. Now, a common type of network is a social network or a contact network in which you have people who are connected by friendship or the amount of time they become in contact with one another. Now, networks have also found some significant use in biology. And if you're a biologist, you've probably heard of the C. elegans worm as its model organism. And pretty interestingly, researchers have actually mapped out the, or every connection that exists between the neurons and the muscles of this animal using networks to do so. Now, networks have also found their way into disease modeling. 
So this network in the center on the bottom here is actually a genotype network, which is going to be the network of interest for this presentation in which we have nodes that are strains and edges connecting these strains if you can jump from one to another with a simple single point mutation. So getting into the first chapter, this introduces a multi-strain epidemic model or blazing trail in the wilderness of epidemic modeling. So an assumption made by many models is that one disease is caused by one pathogen, but this is often not true because many diseases have multiple strains circling at the same time that might cause different symptoms in people or different levels of infectivity or have different immune responses in the host. So in this chapter, I introduce a disease model that first has multiple strains, and then we allow these strains to mutate from one to another, and these strains will have different immune responses in the host. An analysis of this model's infection dynamics shows that there's a second phase transition, which we call the immune invasion threshold, which corresponds to the point at which a strain can effectively infect individuals who have recovered from a different strain. We also see infection localization by strain, which means that certain strains will contribute more infections than other ones simply due to their position in a genotype network. We also see a sort of pseudochaotic infection progression, which is again, instead of having that one curve, we have a sort of roller coaster of infections to work with. So many models are based off of the SIRS model which has been in existence for a while and is a good way to simplify the transmission of disease. So in this model, we have susceptible individuals of a population. We can also consider some people to be infected who are then able to transmit the virus or some disease when they're in that state. And they then progress to a recovered state in time in which they have immunity and cannot become infected. Now you can model the transition between these three states, in this case by the parameters beta, gamma, and alpha, which allows this sort of model to be implemented with a system of differential equations, which allows you to simulate an epidemic under some initial parameterization. Now, this sort of simulation is considered to be deterministic because transitions happen in the same way if you're using the same set of conditions, um, which is a simplification of the randomness you would see in spreading that would be true in a real population but a deterministic model is faster and easier to use. So the model I introduced, again, has multiple strains. So we adapt this SIRS model by creating an infectious and a recovered state for each strain. We also allow mutation between strains that are neighboring in the genotype network, meaning that one mutation can allow them to jump from one to another. Um, now, we also see strain transcending immunity in this model, which means that if you recover from one strain, you'll see that immunity transcend to similar strains, but not to distant strains. Now, this is where the genotype network comes in. We use the genotype network to relate strains genetically and also to determine the level of tra uh, strain transcending immunity as a function of the distance between the strains genetically. Uh, as well as indicate the plausible mutation pathways between these strains. So here we see how a genotype network is constructed. We see three strains here, i, j, and k from left to right, which are the nodes in this network. Now we define um, these nodes or strains by the sequences of amino acids that make up a protein or the proteins of interest of this virus, uh, which you can see an excerpt of that sequence below each of these strains. So what we see is that the middle strain, J, differs by one amino acid from the strain on the left and the strain on the right. So we draw an edge between that strain and the other ones. But if we look at the strain I on the left and K all the way on the right, we see that they differ by a distance of two amino acids, which would be unlikely to happen without a multi-mutation event. So we don't draw an edge between them because it's, we deem it to be an unlikely mutation pathway. Now, if we put this all together, the model looks like this. Um, again, we see an infected and a recovered state that exists for each of the strains. And this recovered state allows one to be immune towards the strain you recovered from, but only partially, if at all, immune towards similar strains or more distant strains. <laughs> 
As I mentioned before, you can use a system of differential equations to model the transition of individuals from the states within this model, uh, a lot, which allows us to model an epidemic. Um, the one thing I just want to point out in these equations is the term that introduces strain transcending immunity, um, which is a decaying function of the genetic distance x sub ij here um, between the strains in the genotype network. I'll answer any questions you have about this implementation later, but for now, let's get to the results. So the first observation about this model is that it has a chaos-like infection progression. Um, so here we use a lattice genotype network shown on the right. And on the left, we see the number of infections in this network as a function of time. So on the y-axis, we have the log transformation of the number of infections and then time on the x-axis. And the black line here indicates the total number of infections during the simulation across all the strains. And if you look at the colored dashed lines, that depicts the number of infections for particular strains in the network. Uh, so what do we see here? We see that the number of infections oscillates pretty wildly in time, uh, especially since it's on a log scale here, so the differences are actually greater than it looks on this plot. Uh, we also see that strains will emerge, disappear largely, and then re-emerge in time. And eventually we see that this model will dampen to an endemic state that is steady for each of the strains. Now, the structure of the network has a pretty big influence on the infection dynamics. Um, here we're looking at a star-shaped network instead of that lattice one. And if we run an epidemic on this one, we see that it produces a quite a bit different um, progression of infections in time. We see that it lacks the, um, or rather that this network structure lab lacks the loops or cycles present in the lattice and it has a much more simple structure, uh, which is in fact uh, reflected in the infection dynamics. Um, now, as we'll see in the next chapter, this sort of network is actually quite a bit more realistic um, to see in a real world network. So even though this plot is kind of a bit boring, since there's only really two types of nodes in this network, it does a good job at showing the underlying dynamics of this model. We see those oscillations of infections and that gradual dampening as it approaches the endemic state. Now, we only see that sort of cyclical nature of infections when we're near the epidemic threshold, which is the level of transmission at which if it were to increase, we would see an outbreak. And if it were to decrease, we would see um, no sustained outbreak. Um, so what we're looking at here is a localization of infections by strains, or the proportion of infections that are contributed to all the infections in a model um, for a particular strain. And what we're looking at here is the nodes that are colored in orange will be nodes that are closer to the maximum number of infections across any strain in the network. The nodes that are in blue will contribute very few infections to the overall number of infections. So we'll see that um, in the lattice, we get a good bit of heterogeneity based on the more complex structure than we see in say the star or the chain network. Now, one of the most important findings from this multiple strain model is the immune invasion threshold which is the point at which infections are efficiently transmitted to those recovered from other strains. Now we find this by looking at the infections of the endemic state. So in this plot, we see the proportion of individuals infected in the endemic state, depending on the strength of transmission along the x-axis. Now I'm gonna have you focus only on these blue lines at first to narrow in on the infected proportion. So now this infected proportion usually increases pretty sharply at one in a single strain model, but we see it grow slowly at first before then growing at this dashed line here, um, going or at about a transmission rate of six or seven here, which indicates where the immune invasion threshold is for this particular simulation. Um, and again, this is a point where transmission becomes strong enough to infect those who are recovered from other strains. Um, we can see this by plotting the number of recovered individuals across all strains in orange here. And we see at that immune invasion threshold that begins to dip down because the infected or the infections are pulling people out of that recovered state efficiently. Now, this is an important observation because public health interventions often work by adjusting the transmission rate up or down 
uh, the x-axis here. And better understanding the shape of this curve uh, can improve how accurately we can predict the effectiveness of an intervention. So the main takeaways from this model are first that one disease often does not equal one pathogen. Second, that multi-strain models allow for complex infection dynamics, which may be able to explain fluctuations um, in infections at the strain level. Uh, finally, we see that genotype network structure matters because of strain transcending immunity and mutation pathways. Now, this next section extends on that idea that genotype network structure matters and looks at some real world networks. So this is that getting your hands dirty with the real data part of the project here. So in this case, we'll be looking at influenza A subtype H3N2 and constructing a genotype network for it and then characterizing its structure since we don't really know what it looks like. Now, the evolution of influenza depends on selection driven by the human immune system. So we wanna make sure that when we make this network, it becomes antigenically meaningful um, to do so, or rather, this means that when we construct the genotype network, we wanna use a portion of its sequence that is recognized by the human immune system and under pressure to evolve away from past strains to make sure we're really looking at a structure of the virus that's important. So you may have heard of the spike protein um, in the coronavirus um, viral particle. And the influenza virus has something pretty similar. So there are a couple of surface proteins on the influenza A virus, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And we really wanna focus on hemagglutinin here. So this protein allows the viral particle to bind to the host cell in the human body and then transfer its um, genetic material to the nucleus of the cell, which then that host cell replicates this virus and allows it to proliferate in the host. Um, now, this is also the protein that contains sites that the uh, human immune system uses to recognize the virus. So not only is it meaningful in the function of the virus, it's also meaningful in how your body responds to it, which makes it a target for vaccine development and important for the viral evolution. So it would make sense to construct the genotype network out of this protein sequences. Um, each unique sequence of this protein will then be considered as a node or a strain in this network. Now edges in this network, again, will be defined as some unit of genetic or antigenic difference. And here we're gonna define that as a difference of one amino acid between the sequences of this protein, um, which allows it to be considered as a plausible mutation pathway between strains. So what we're looking at here is a influenza genotype network for subtype A, H3N2, constructed from about 20 years of data, from 1999 to about a year ago. So there are about 28,000 um, samples or sequence samples that were accurate enough to be used for network construction. And we see that there's nearly 10,000 unique sequences or strains or nodes in this network, which implies that a number of these strains were sampled multiple times. We also see that there's about 7,500 edges or plausible mutation pathways between the nodes of this network. So if you take a closer look at this network, you'll see that there are a lot of these hub-like regions that have a high degree connected by these more sparse chain-like regions. We also see this sort of cloud of different colored nodes in the middle. Um, now these are nodes that aren't connected to any other ones, um, which implies that if we were to increase the number of samples we took of a population, we might have greater resolution of all the evolutionary pathways and be able to connect these to other components. Now an important feature of a network is its degree distribution. The degree of a node is how many connections or neighbors it has. So if we plot the complementary cumulative distribution function of degree, we see a straight line on a log-log scale. Now this shows a power law or heavy tail distribution, which might imply some scale-free process um, in the generation of this network that could explain its structure. Now we can do the same 
for the component size distribution. Now, the components of a network are the connected subparts of it. So a component would be thought of as like an island where you can follow edges from one node to any other node in that component. And again, this reveals a heavy tail or heavy tail component size distribution, which is suggesting some sort of scale free process that might determine component size for this network. Now we also see a strong correlation between the number of times a strain was sampled and its degree. Um, so we expect a high degree and highly prevalent strains since more infections gives more opportunity for that strain to mutate to uh, other ones. Um, and since it, as this relationship shows, we sample these strains accordingly, it appears that there isn't too much sampling bias in regards to strain prevalence. But there is a bit of a geographic bias in this data set as the samples disproportionately come from North America. Now, the genotype network for influenza is a temporal network, meaning that the time points um, of each node can be considered to be important. Um, so we'll see that certain regions are active for strain emergence here. So what we're looking at is a component of this network. Um, with, that has strains which were first sampled from about 2010 up to 2018. Um, we'll see that uh, the network kind of evolves away from these older strains in blue on the left side here um, over towards the right hand side in red um, for the more recent strains. So what we see here is that network is always changing but it's pretty self-similar regardless of where it is in this temporal progression meaning that you'll see these uh, same features like the hubs and the chain-like stretches between them uh, in all parts of the network, regardless of when that part of the network came into existence. So this plot here shows in the black dots and lines, the number of nodes in the network using a five-year window of it. Um, and in red, we see the number of edges in that same five-year window. And the hollow points here show the same values, but only for that largest connected component of the network. So we see that in the network, there's a pretty big increase in sampling rates at about 2008, 2010. And despite this rapid growth of the network in the past decade or so, we tend to see some pretty consistent structures within it. So what we're looking at here in this middle plot is the slope of that complementary cumulative distribution for degree and component size as shown a couple of slides ago. Now these parameters are features of that possible scale-free process that describes network growth. And like I said, it appears to be pretty constant in time, regardless of the rapidly growing network. Similarly, we can look at the clustering coefficient or C global on the Y axis here which also appears to be pretty consistent in time. So this parameter um, explains the proportion of possible triangles um, that could exist in the network um, formed by edges. Uh, in the case of a genotype network, these triangles would indicate multiple mutations at the same site. Um, so what we can say from this or conclude from this is that the um, rate at which multiple mutations occur at the same site seems pretty constant in time. So now, why do these heavy tail degree distributions emerge in this genotype network? So here I use some randomly generated networks um, using or varying the number of edges in them along the x-axis by the edge probability or density. And then using that epidemic model from the first chapter to look at the endemic infection proportion along the y-axis here. Um, this is done for varying levels of strain transcending immunity, indicated by the delta parameter here, where larger values of delta means that immunity spreads more widely. So what we see here is that for small values of edge probability, the networks become sparse and lack enough mutation pathways um, for the infections to escape immunity, um, or rather to gain access to other strains. Now, as we go up in edge probability, we see that the networks become a bit too dense to sustain a large number of infections because the strain transcending immunity begins to overpower these strains. So what we see here is that the disease succeeds the most or causes the most infections 
near a density of edges that's associated with a heavy tailed component size distribution, which is shown by the dashed vertical line here. Now, this possibly explains that distribution seen for component size in the influenza network. So, in conclusion here, we see that the influenza genotype network contains a lot of hubs which indicate these highly prevalent strains. Um, we also see the chains that suggest an ability for the virus to escape immunity rapidly. And we also observe the scale-free nature of degree and component size for the network, which might be explained by that strain transcending immunity. Now the third chapter is on age weighting and network generative models. So the problem here is that we don't know how genotype networks grow. So what I did was find some network generative models and the parameters that might be able to explain a target genotype network. Now to do so, I had to implement this method called approximate Bayesian computation. Now the outcomes were that we found there exists an interaction between degree and age-weighted preferential attachment in these network generative models. And we also identified a network generative model that was pretty accurately able to reproduce the structure of an influenza genotype network. So the method used in this chapter, approximate Bayesian computation, can be implemented with a rejection sampling algorithm. So in this model, you have two things. You have a network generative model, which according to some function f of x and some input parameters x, you're able to stochastically generate a series of similar networks. And we also have a target network that we want to fit this generative model to. So the question becomes, which values of these parameters best reproduce that target network? So going through the rejection sampling algorithm, we sample X from the prior, which means that we take values from, for those parameters, which we think might be reasonable for them. We then run them through this generative model, F of X, and produce this network G with them. Now this network G will vary a little bit um, from run to run, even for the same parameters. What we wanna do next is evaluate how similar this generated network is to our target network. In this case, that will be our genotype network. And if our networks are similar enough, we add our parameter values X to the posterior or the posterior distribution, which is defined as the values of those parameters that are best able to reproduce the target network. Now, how do we compare the generated networks to the target? Uh, we do this by determining the graph distance. So networks can be represented by an adjacency matrix, which you see two of them here which stores the connections that exist between nodes as ones and where they don't as zeros. So in this case, the headers or the rows and columns would indicate each node and the value in the matrix would indicate whether or not an edge is present between those two nodes of the network. Now we can do a little bit of linear algebra on these matrices to pull out the differences in their eigenvalues, which gives us a measure of how similar these graphs are. And that is how we're gonna evaluate the distance between our generated networks and our target networks. So we now know how to compare the generated networks to the target, but now we need to know the functions that we use to generate these networks. So an important network construction method is based off of building a network one node at a time with preference for degree. Attaching a node to a previous node and giving preferences to existing nodes that have high degree. So this will end up with a network that has a few nodes with some high degree, uh, which seems approximate enough to replicate um, what a genotype network might look like. But here I focused on attaching based on preference for age, which can be done with a variety of functions. As you add nodes one step at a time, maybe you give preference and are more likely to add nodes to nodes that were more recently added or maybe you give preferences to nodes that were added a long time ago in the network. So we're able to combine the preference for degree and preference for node using this function here uh, for a given node to be added at a given time step um, by using the product of these preferences. 
So we can implement a variety of the functions for that preference for age. Here we see three functions of age. Um, so on the x-axis here, we see how long a node has been in the network for. And on the y-axis here, the preference for that node as a function of age. So if we start on the left and look at a threshold-based age weighting function, this allows us to give normal preferences to a node that exists in the network for attachment of a new node up until a certain age, at which point any node older than that age we will not connect to in that network. Now we also can use a power law age weighting function in which you take the age of a node in the network and raise it to this parameter alpha sub tau, which can give you a growing or a waning uh, preference as a function of that node's age. Uh, finally, we have a normalized Poisson function of age, which can sort of mimic an epidemic curve on the right here. Now this is controlled by one parameter, a lambda, which indicates the peak of that curve. So if we go ahead and look at the approximate Bayesian computation of parameters for the Poisson function, um, we do this by constructing networks randomly drawn from parameters which we think might make sense for this model. So here we see a distribution of the distance between generated networks and our target network, um, where a smaller distance on the left here closer to zero means that those parameters we selected to make the network uh, better replicates the target network. So what we wanna do is take the smallest values below some threshold as our posterior distribution and take a look at what those values are. So here we see the posterior distribution of the parameter alpha sub k for degree preference, uh, which can allow for nonlinear preferential attachment based on the degree of nodes that exist in the network. So what we want to look for here is as we shrink our error tolerance closer to zero, from red to blue to green, we want to look for some convergence on the best value for this parameter, which we seem to see as it looks like it converges on values at around one or so. And we can do the same for the second parameter that's used in this model, the lambda parameter, which defines that peak or that midpoint of the Poisson distribution uh, for age-weighted uh, preference for attachment. Now, what we look here as we go from red to blue to green is we don't see that same convergence like the parameter for degree-based preference for attachment until we look at it in two dimensions. So we see that these values actually do converge um, but we have to note that they depend on one another. So that if you have a particular value of lambda, there's only a certain number of values for the nonlinear preferential attachment for degree that can be used for it. So what we see here is that this model can closely fit the target genotype network while utilizing both degree and age-weighted preferential attachment. Now, if you use a threshold function of age here, we can just focus on the right two-dimensional plot of the two parameters for this slide. We see an interesting finding in the relationship between preference for degree on the y-axis as before, um, but this time we have the threshold-based functions parameter, which is that threshold t here on the x-axis, um, or the max age at which we can attach to a node that exists in the network. We see that in this case, the best replicates of the target network are dependent upon a threshold of about 20, um, which indicates that there seems to be a need for this age weighting feature of the generative model in that preference for attachment based on degree alone cannot fully explain our target network that we see. So in conclusion of this chapter, we see that approximate Bayesian computation is a valid method for determining network model parameters. We also see that preferential attachment by age interacts with degree-based preference. And then in certain cases, age and degree-weighted preference for attachment is needed to reproduce the target network. In that degree-weighted preferential attachment, as is classic, uh, and models like this is not sufficient alone to explain the heavy tail degree distribution we see in our target network. So in this last chapter, I'm gonna to present to you a multivalent vaccination strategy. So the goal here is to introduce a theoretical multivalent vaccination selection method due to how challenging vaccine strain selection can be.
So the work here is to use a genetic algorithm to determine the optimal selection of multiple strains for a vaccine. And we see that the method we uh, introduce here is valid to simplify multivalent vaccine strain selection when evaluating strain combinations through computational simulation. So the question is, given a genotype network, how do we pick a few strains to best protect against all strains in the network? The answer is we want to accurately determine vaccine coverage from those few strains for all possible combinations of strains. Except it would be impractical to use that many amino assays in a laboratory, so simulations enable more combinations to be considered here. But it's even computationally expensive to address this question, meaning that it takes too long to accurately simulate effectiveness of strain combinations. So we have to find a way to test those, or only those that are important. So here we see on the y-axis a proxy of how long it takes to simulate all possible vaccine strain combinations as a function of the number of strains you consider on the x-axis or the size of the genotype network. So if you compare the black dots here to the purple line, this shows basically how complex or how much time it takes on a log scale um, to explore the vaccine strain combinations to find a good one. Um, now the black dots here indicate our model's implementation, which offers about a seven order of magnitude reduction in the time it takes to find a decent combination of strains uh, to implement. So the question becomes, how should we pick a strain in the genotype network to vaccinate? And the answer is by exploiting strain transcending immunity. So if we vaccinate for a node or a strain in the network, the population then becomes unable to spread that strain if we completely vaccinate for it in the population. And it also removes mutation pathways among other strains in the network. What we also see is that the immunity spreads enough on the genotype network to keep some of the nearby strains below the epidemic threshold, making them unable to so uh, support an outbreak if a case were to occur at these strains. So the next question is, which strains should we vaccinate if we can choose multiple? We want to pick strains whose immunity transcends to many strains and also to restrict the number of mutation pathways that exist among those strains that are still super critical in the genotype network and are still able to cause an outbreak. So to find effective combinations of strains without testing for all of them or guessing, we use a genetic algorithm. So the first thing we do in this genetic algorithm approach is we take a few strains to vaccinate at random. And then we do that a few more times until we have a set of random strain combinations. What we do next is we then test how well these combinations cover the genotype network, seeing how many strains they prevent from causing an outbreak. Now we might find that one set of strains does a good job at preventing a lot of strains from being super critical we see that one might have little effect and only affects a few strains, and one might be in the middle. So the next step here is to sample from our uh, randomly selected vaccine strain sets, proportional to how well they did. And what we do, or what we'll get here, is that we end up with a set of vaccines that are biased towards the better ones. What we do next is we take these good or better solutions and then we can recombine their parts and mix them up a bit uh, in the hopes that we can get a more effective solution. We also throw in a few random strains at a small rate to make sure that we're trying a variety of solutions. So we repeat this until we get a new set of vaccine strains that with enough repetitions should end up with some that are pretty effective. So what we're looking at here is an example of a representative solution for an actual influenza network. So this solution here um, is considered to be good by the algorithm and offer good coverage of the strains in this network. We see that the algorithm picked of these four strains uh, a number of hubs in the network, which offered a lot of local coverage. 
But we also saw that it picked a few of these bridging strains um, between the denser regions that might have been able to cut off some of the mutation pathways between the strains. Next, we wanted to look at the effectiveness against future strains for a particularly determined vaccination method. So our implementation here was evaluated on only a portion of a genotype network to find a vaccination strategy that worked well in the long term. Um, so what we did is we generated a or a set of solutions for a network only looking at part of it. What we did next is we allowed that network to grow in time and have more nodes or strains attached to it and see how well our solutions um, or strain combinations performed in the long term. So what we're looking at here is on the y-axis, we see a measure of how good or bad a particular strain combination is, where a lower value of fitness would be better in this case. Um, what we're looking at in the x-axis here is how much we let that network grow after we determine that particular set of strains to vaccinate against. Now in the gray boxes here, we look at um, a distribution of the strain combinations that we had determined with our algorithm compared to in the blue box plot random solutions. And we see that the uh, constructed solutions or strain combinations do decay slowly in time, but they do remain better than random solutions. Now this was a little bit counterintuitive because we figured that some of the randomly determined combinations of strains might actually do better um, if they stick a strain near the end of the network where it's growing. But that happened to not be the case. Um, so the algorithm we implemented did seem to be robust to network growth or emergence of strains in the future. So in conclusion of this chapter, we've shown that genetic algorithms can efficiently find multivalent vaccination strain combinations and that vaccinations are resilient towards network growth in the future. And importantly, this method relies upon an underlying genotype network as introduced in the earlier chapters. Now, the conclusion of this whole body of work here. So, multi-strain epidemic models with an underlying genotype network structure reveals complex epidemic dynamics as we saw with the cycles and the infection localization. Um, now we see that influenza genotype networks appear to be shaped by strain transcending immunity, as is evidenced by the scale-free distributions of component size and that similarity to the optimal edge density for maximum infections. Age-weighted preferential attachment seems to be a, or seems necessary to reproduce the structure that we observe in real-world genotype networks. And we also note that it interacts with degree-based preference. Finally, a multivalent vaccination strategy based on a genotype network strain suppression drastically reduced computational complexity and provided solutions or uh, multivalent strain combinations that were resilient to network growth. So for future work, there's a question we want to answer, which is, the random networks with heavy tail distri uh, degree distributions have the greatest number of infections. Now this would support or refute the role of strain transcending immunity in determining genotype network degree distribution in addition to what we had shown in determining the component size distribution. We also want to take a look at the role of age-weighted preferential attachment in other types of networks. Um, given how important it seemed to be for this network type, we think that it might be or it might come up in other types of networks. We also want to take a look at the structure of genotype networks um, of other viruses or pathogens, um, since these networks seem to have some signatures of some of the evolutionary processes of these pathogens. We want to see if those of other pathogens might be identifiable based on simply the structure of the genotype network. So, I would like to acknowledge Chase, Gary, Peter, and Laurent for taking their time to um, participate um, in this defense um, and contribute to the development of a young researcher. I would also like to thank collaborators Guillaume Sinonge, Alex Burnham, and Tom Soleri. Um, so Guillaume had worked on chapter one with me, which we have in submission um, for publication. And then Alex and Thomas worked on chapter four with me.
I would also like to acknowledge professors Maggie Epstein and James Bagro, um, through whose courses projects have developed into some chapters in this work. I would also like to thank Brandon Odvenu for being the reason I engage in biological research, um, and by extension, Sam Scarpino for introducing me to infectious disease modeling and network science. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blake. Uh, if anyone, I invite you all to unmute and thank the speaker. Very nice. Yeah, great work. So if you all want to stay unmuted, um, before we move on to the private part of the defense where the, the evaluation committee will meet with Blake and, and, and grill him until exhaustion of, of Blake or more likely of the committee, uh, we still have you know a couple of minutes um, or, or quite a bit of time if we want for open questions from you all. So I'll, I'll let the floor for discussions and questions. Uh, I, well, so I have a, a comment, but hopefully it's a, a friendly comment or useful. Um, so first, Blake, that was fantastic. Um, I've I've seen a lot of defenses, and this is this is right at the top, uh, even even at the PhD level. So not surprising, but but really fantastic work and presentation. Um, my comment is just that I saw on Twitter this morning that the Bloom Lab has developed a similar data set um, for COVID. Uh, as as you described for influenza, and I think it would be fascinating. Not that everything has to be COVID, but fascinating to think about applications of this to to that to that new data set. Right, and that's actually something I'm considering um, with the current lab group I'm working on. So, in the lab group I've since joined, um, it is more of a translational research lab, um, but we also have this um, COVID surveillance study um, perspective. And we might be able to take some of our um, sequences from that and take a look at what the structure looks like. So that's actually pretty exciting that. So in addition to like the existing database of COVID samples that exist to have some um, fresh samples and take a look at that structure. Um, it'd be interesting to see what that looks like um, in a disease on a much shorter time scale um, to see if the structure varies um, due to a difference in the selective pressures that might not include seasonality yet because I mean we've only been dealing with um, COVID for a number of months now but with influenza I mean it's been 50 years even for this particular subtype. Actually I guess maybe I do have a question but I'll just ask it and you don't have to answer so someone else can can ask questions but now that I'm thinking about that do you think you could tell from the observed genotypes of COVID in the population, whether it's experiencing meaningful selection pressure from the human immune system and generating escape variants, uh, just based on the network structure without actually the lab studies? Yeah, so I, my thoughts are, I think so. Because if you look at phylogenetic trees, um, was it that like the, a narrow sort of structure and not like a wide tree will indicate or be suggestive that there's some selective pressure going on, which you should be able to see in a genotype network as well um, with that sort of like string like pushing out um, without a lot of growth in one region. So my thoughts are that if the network um, looks to be pretty stretched out, then that would be suggestive of um, more selective pressure um, from host immunity in the population. Great, thank you. If there are any other questions, feel free to simply unmute. Um, we don't have to use the hand raising system. Just, just some Blake. I'm assuming you can't see the chat, so I'll just say just a lot of very positive comments from people. Um, very well done for the, on the presentation. And if there are no more questions, then we're right on the hour, so it's going to be time um, for us to move to the private 
part of the defense. So I would invite you all except the evaluation committee and the candidate to leave. I don't want to have to kick anyone out. So please leave on your own. <laughs> and thank, thank you, you for, for your time, everybody. This was great.